as, as fans of Games of Thrones, likely you know you win or you die. Or if you're Jon Snow, even when you appear to be dead, you have the potential to come back stronger than ever. Which is a lot like being a media leader right now, incidentally. That you might be king of content, but if you don't constantly reinvent and resurrect your business, you could face overthrow and even disruption. In the case of the speaker we've gathered to hear this afternoon, I'm confident there's very little danger of his being dethroned or his cable kingdom being overthrown. I'm Frank Benick, and uh, I'm very privileged to be chairman of the Paley Center. My day job is as executive vice chairman of a little company called Hearst, and uh, I'm pleased to be able to welcome all of you here this afternoon. It's an exciting time to be talking about Richard Pleepler, the CEO of HBO, on the future of cable television and HBO's role in it. While I know you're eager to hear from him, please allow me just a few minutes of housekeeping moments. I ask for that as a, as a personal privilege. I'm especially thrilled to see some of my fellow trustees here in the audience, Gus Hauser, Stan Schumann, and Ed Schuyler. The board of directors of this place have been phenomenal over its long history, and a lot of what goes on here is the product of their thought process and their financial support. And we always want to extend our thanks to our long-term and valued partner, McKinsey, who serves as our official knowledge partner. We're also delighted to have many of you who are media council members in attendance. However, if you're not a media council member, I highly encourage you to join this distinguished group of media executives so you can have access to more events and conversations like this one. In addition to our Paley Dialogue series in New York, our media council also hosts evenings with leading CEOs in Los Angeles, as we will on June 2nd, when we will have an event uh, uh, with, and a VIP reception and have a conversation with Sony Picture Television Chairman Steve Mosco. Finally, I hope you will consider joining us on May 18th in New York for our tribute to Hispanic achievements in television, a historic evening celebrating the contributions of seven decades of pioneers, icons, and groundbreaking moments. It will be a star-studded evening celebrating the contribution of seven decades of pioneers and icons. Uh, to help us celebrate will be Bobby Cannavale, Oscar De La Hoya, Emilio and Gloria Estevan, America Ferreira, George Lopez, and Jimmy Smith, to just name a few. Uh, those of you who attended the tribute to the black contribution to television know it was a fabulous evening and very well received and something that I'm very proud of. I know this will be the same and hope all of you, who, if you, if you haven't signed up to come, will do so. Okay, back to today and to the event and to our luncheon guest, Richard Pleepler. Here at the Paley Center for Media, we celebrate and explore the legacy and future of television. In the case of Home Box Office, I can say, as you would all agree, it embodies both. With Richard at the helm, HBO is one of the most successful pay TV services in the world, and I think you can take pay out. I think you can say it's one of the most successful television services in the world. Its two networks, HBO and Cinemax, have over 127 million subscribers worldwide and have been the source of some of the most critically acclaimed and innovative shows on television. Many of them discuss with their stars and creators over time here at Paley. Game of Thrones alone, God, it's on all the time at my house, is watched by nearly 18 million viewers per episode in the U.S. And whether it's that Machiavellian fantasy world, the comic travails of the first woman to occupy the White House uh, on Veep, or the startup scene of Silicon Valley, HBO's brand new season demonstrates how the premium cable network is a must watch and must talk or tweet television. And it's not just the programming at HBO that's kept it up with the times under Richard's leadership. As our moderator, Brian Stelter, the host of CNN's Reliable Sources, put it in a recent profile of Richard, HBO is fundamentally a different company than it was just 10 years ago. Brian was talking about HBO's OTT streaming service, HBO Now, which has just celebrated its first year of service this month and something 
along with many other interesting things I'm sure they will be discussing today. With that in mind, it's my great pleasure to welcome to the stage Brian Stelter, a veteran of the New York Times and CNN, and Richard Plepper. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, thank you uh, for inviting me to be here today. Uh, Richard, we're speaking, it's such a, a perfect week for this because we just saw Time Warner earnings yesterday. Uh, Time Warner, of course, my parent, your parent. Uh, and uh, I think on the call, you held back a little bit about HBO Now. No new numbers for how many people are subscribing via streaming. So can you tell us anything today, now that earnings season is over, about how you know, HBO Now is doing? HBO Now is doing great, actually. And um, we saw a lot of activity, not surprisingly, um, around Game of Thrones. Mm. And we're continuing to build the brand. But so people the, sign up because the new season is starting. I think, first of all, people are coming to recognize uh, that it's there. Um, our, our marketing and advertising um, is reaching out to that part of the 13 million broadband-only universe that doesn't have a cable satellite or telco subscription. So we're making it available. But look, here's this, this is the fundamental point about, uh, about now. HBO Now is simply an additional piece of our distribution strategy. Just as satellite augmented the cable business, telco business augmented the satellite and the cable business, and now digital augments all three. So we don't, we're not sitting there looking uh, at HBO Now and saying this is going to be uh, transformative to our growth, which we think is exciting and dynamic over the coming years. It's gonna be a piece of our growth. And as that, as you well know, is that piece of the consumer base grew from five million when we first started thinking about HBO Now to about 13 and a half million as we sit here today. Hmm. That was simply too big a piece um, of the consumer base not to serve. Now, we're, we're very excited and determined to work with our partners in the traditional ecosystem to bundle HBO Now. So hmm. all of this is part and parcel of a means for us to expand our distribution, make HBO available to the consumer how they want it, when they want it, and where they want it. It's the word it's you used a, a year ago, it's multi... A, it is multilateral Multilateral. Exactly, it is not binary. It is but do you Thank think some people have lost that? my quote. Well, because that was, that was the message in April of last year. That's, it's been that, a that's year. That, that's Are exactly some people right. forgetting it, though? Is that the concern in the marketplace? You need people to no. recognize that no, look, most people are still going to get HBO the traditional way? I, I don't think people have forgotten it at all. Look, okay. we grew... Uh, let me give you some perspective. We've grown in the last uh, three and a half years or so more than in any three and a half year period in 30 years, right? And so what does that tell you? It tells you that the brand is as vibrant and healthy as ever. And our job is simply to expand the optionality for the consumer mm -hmm. to get HBO. But when we talk to our cable partners, we talk to our telco partners, our satellite partners, we're interested in all means of bundling HBO in disseminating the product and the brand as expansively as we can, not only domestically, but globally as well, which is why we've added an OTT component that you saw us announce last month in Brazil, mm -hmm. in Spain, uh, earlier in the month in, in uh, or excuse me, er, earlier in the year in, in, uh, in Mexico and Colombia. Mm -hmm. So instead of just licensing our product, instead of just our network's business in 60 countries, we're now putting a new tier of multilateralism on international distribution as well. So it's all about consumer options and availability. But I think you're gonna see, just to punctuate the point, the vast proportion of growth mm -hmm. being in the traditional ecosystem. In the traditional. Now, you, you suggested more bundling with broadband in, in your first answer. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the idea. I think it's Cablevision currently that sells and, HBO and now with broadband. And, and Verizon. And I think Will others do that? I believe so. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you take a look, for example, at Let's take a look at, at, at New Charter, for example, mm -hmm. right? Um, which will be the second largest uh, broadband provider behind, uh, behind Comcast. So they're going to have, in, the, in New Charter, there'll be six million broadband-only subs. Mm -hmm. So we, we want to grow with New Charter as much as possible. We think there's tremendous opportunity to grow with this new company. The blended penetration after the mergers is quite low. Mm -hmm. Charter's penetration is much higher. We think together we can mm -hmm. grow that going forward. HBO helps them grow their video. They help us grow. Why wouldn't 
among their broadband only subscribers, which is about six million people, why wouldn't you want to bundle HBO now and share in the, in the profit and in the growth? I, I, I think that would make sense. That'll be up to them, how they want to grow the business, but I think everybody realizes that's another means of expanding uh, our brand into the consumer base. Are there any other impacts from the Charter Time Warner Cable uh, acquisition that'll affect you? Assuming it'll close later this month, mm -hmm. anything else that affects HBO? I think the most dynamic and exciting thing is that um, Charter has been a terrific uh, partner and a terrific performer, and their penetration continues to rise. Um, so you quite, mean you have quite, more Charter customers yeah. per thousand than Time Warner Cable? That's correct. Huh. And so I think the, if you look at the blended penetration of the new company, mm -hmm. there's a, a, a huge opportunity for them mm -hmm. and a huge opportunity for us to take that penetration up much, much higher. Mm. That's terrific for them and terrific for us. I'm, I'm a win-win guy, and so I think that you can design these deals with all your partners in a way that helps all of our businesses grow. Mm. HBO has always been a part of cable growth, satellite growth, telescope growth, mm -hmm. and now will be a part of digital growth as well. And international growth, uh, everyone knows that Netflix basically turned itself on in every market. Uh, it's hard to have visibility into every country, country by country, and know how well it's doing or not. But what's your attitude about that versus Netflix's, about how you grow in these countries? Because so far, it's, it's a handful, and it's growing from there. Yeah, so let's look at the international marketplace. So we, worldwide, we're at about 130 million subscribers. So we have networks in 60 countries, Latin America, uh, Eastern Europe, and Asia. We license our programming into about 150 markets and territories around the world. We have home of HBO deals in, in 13 countries where we share the name and then they take our entire you know, oeuvre of programming mm. and market Sky Atlantic, home of HBO, Sky Italia, home of HBO, Foxtel in Australia, just did a deal with Bell Canada. So what's our strategy globally? It's pretty simple, stealing from uh, uh, all the president's men. We follow the money. And, and what we want to do is we want to think strategically about long-term profits, and where we can make more money doing a licensing deal over time, we're gonna do a licensing deal. Where we think we have a networks opportunity, we're gonna do a, a, a networks deal. Where we can do both, like in the Nordics, where we have an OTT business and a linear business, we're gonna do that. When we look at a market like Spain, and we assess broadband penetration, brand <laughs> recognition, the receptivity of that market to a broadband only product, we're going to do a broadband only deal. So it's case by case, country by country. We follow the money and we're doing, you know, about uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of about, um, you know, billion, billion and a half, billion six of revenue around the world and that's going to grow going forward. And as cable penetration grows mm -hmm. around the world, we grow with that. Is it an advantage for Netflix to have one way of doing it all around the world versus your multiple ways? No, I think uh, I like the dexterity of what we're able to do. Mm -hmm. And we're, because we, big point, because we own our own content, mm -hmm. we have an enormous amount of versatility, mm -hmm. right? So we show up with our programming, that's a very powerful brand, and we can decide with our partners how we want to grow our business. Mm -hmm. And in a country like Brazil, we can do both. And have a networks business and an OTT business. Mm. So I like our model a lot. I like our profit growth a lot. I like our margin opportunity a lot. And I like the flexibility. What's not working? Or what are your, what are your key well, challenges this year? I just finished telling you we've grown more in the last That's three right. and a half years. So, than any three so I'm going to start to poke so holes. I, I'm so looking you, around. You can, you can, you know, facts are stubborn things. So <laughs> what, the, 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 the growth is what the growth is. Let me is, is the problem me, more competition than ever? Is that me, the challenge? Let me, answer, let me answer the what keeps me up at night question, right? Because I'm a worrier. So <laughs> look, there is absolutely more competition, as we all know, than at, at any time in my 20, uh, 20 years or so at the company. So that means you need to be on your toes all the time. I think we enjoy a wonderful advantage because our brand uh, is so powerful that in talent over the years has had such a terrific experience at our place. You know, what you know, Michael Douglas said to me, interestingly, you know, he said, look, I've done I, I, I've, I've been around a long time. I've worked um, in a lot of companies. There's something in the water here. Hmm. It's, you know, it's your PR team, your marketing team, 
you know, my, 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 my lawyers tell me, your business affairs team, it's a pleasure to be here. And part of our job, because we're only as good as the people who come to work with us, part of our job is making that experience for talent uh, so, so dynamic and so exciting that it becomes catalytic and that they want to come back and they tell other people. And that mm -hmm. is a virtuous circle. And what we're proudest about is the number of people that want to come back and continue to do things. Both you know, established stars like Spielberg and Hanks or new stars, if you will, people like Mike Judge and Alec Berg who are doing Silicon Valley, um, you know, Armando and Julia who, who, who do Veep. You want people's experience to be um, second to none. Um, and and that, that is really the secret to continuing to be a magnet. Talent is a sacred thing, and we're here in the service of talent because we aren't the talent. We don't make the shows. We don't write the shows. If we're smart and we're on top of it and we're a little bit lucky, we're saying yes to the right things and the right people, and then the magic happens. But magic's out there. Our, our, our job is to go get it. So I would just say, look, there's, I don't think it's a zero-sum game. Um, I send notes all the time to our competition uh, saying, well done. Um, I, I, I watched the OJ miniseries. I thought it was terrific. Um, I sent Peter a note. I sent John Langreth a note. The, the notion that because... Have you sent Reed any notes? Uh, uh, or yes. Ted? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And, and when I see them at an event, I walk up and congratulate them. Again, with... with in, 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 in a time of House of Cards and yeah. Orange is the New Black and Transparent and Homeland and all this great stuff, we just, we just finished an Emmy season where we won more awards than any time in our history. Mm. We have more variety of stuff on than any time in our history. We're working with more different kinds of talent. Um, I would just say, you know, last week Beyonce um, you know, dropped her video on, I was going to ask on, about on, that. On HBO. Yeah. Well, that's, I'll tell you why that's interesting to I want to hear about I'll, that. I'll tell you why that's interesting. So she's a heat-seeking missile to <laughs> the zeitgeist, right? She, she, you know, she's not making a choice uh, because we're more charming than another network or, you know, even quite frankly that she had a great experience when she did her, her concert in Paris with us. I think she's making the decision, and her team's making the decision. A, she did have a good experience when she did the concert, but she chose HBO. She could have she done that, and as you well know, it became a social media mm -hmm. phenomenon. It did very well on the network. She chose us, I think, because the brand stands for something, mm. and we're very proud of that. So we had a prize fight on Saturday night with Gennady Golovkin that did very well, a rising star in the middleweight division. We then had the Beyonce thing. Then we went in to Thrones and to Silicon Valley and to Veep. And don't forget a huge theatrical movie advantage, which is still, and everybody forgets this because right. the right. halo around our original programming takes up so much noise. Movies is 78% of viewing on the network, 71% mm. across all platforms, 64% of on-demand viewing. It's a big thing. And we have four Hollywood movie studios, mm. and the delta between us and other services has grown only greater. So mm. you look at a movie like Jurassic Park and you think, well, you know, it's a year old. Millions and millions, and at the end of its run, tens of millions of people are going to watch that. So what we're trying to do is build a bunch of addicts mm. to our brand across a wide range of programming. And if we're doing our job right, addicts are coming from different places. So some people are coming in and they're obsessed with vice and, they, and they, uh, that, that's how they're getting their news, and they see Vice as the voice of a, a, a kind of new gener generation of journalism. Some people are coming in because they love John Oliver and, and Bill, and then they turn around and they love our documentaries. And it's bits and pieces of everything that we think lure people to the network so that they say, you know, Abe Rosenthal, when he um, edited The Times years ago, I, I think he had a, had a wonderful line. He said, I want my readers pick up the New York Times at, at least once a day and say, holy shit, mm. right? And we want our subscribers to turn on the network a couple times, a few times a week and say, holy shit. They do not have to be watching. We're selling a brand. And we want that brand to be resonant. And we want that brand to be special. And we want it to be differentiated. Mm. And so our consumers 
current and new. We want drawn there because they know something special is going on. That's our job. I had a Beyonce moment where I was on a train, everyone was tweeting about the video, and Good. for the first time I had to open up the app and watch live, but through the app. And I wonder if your issue with HBO Go and HBO Now really is getting, having that moment for people where they have to open it up and have to either subscribe yeah. or use it. Look, we're, we're thinking all the time about how certain scheduling constraints were removed mm -hmm. by uh, the elegance of, of. Of, of HBO Now's on-demand capacity. But right. by the way, anything that's on HBO Now is also on HBO Go. Right. So you can do that For if me you're- For it was on HBO Go. That's right. great. Right. So yes, Vice News, which we're hatching now with Tom and with Shane as a daily news show. John when Stewart- When will that launch, by the way? Uh, probably fall. It's sort of summer, competition fall. for me, so I'm curious. It won't be competition for you. It'll be augmenting your extraordinary work that you and your. <laughs> so how you will so how will Vice how will a daily Vice newscast be different from all the rest? Look, what I've seen. You haven't had that before on HBO. The 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 uh, concept that Shane and Tom and I discussed initially was, wouldn't it be exciting if we could produce a daily news show, mm -hmm. primarily driven at the Vice target audience? which was captivating, had a little more context and nuance to it than perhaps you know, simply scanning uh, the, the internet, and where we could bring a level of sophistication to complexity that was also very engaging. That was our, that was our mission statement to each other. Mm -hmm. And um, because Vice had already done so well on HBO, and had developed an audience. And because the Vice brand itself stood for something, we thought the marriage of HBO and Vice News made some sense. We went out and got Josh Tarango, who's a very distinguished journalist um, and, and, and editor, to be the executive editor. And we think we're going to do something um, that'll be very, very much differentiated mm -hmm. from, from what's out there and augmenting news opportunity and news sources, uh, primarily for millennials, but I think for other people as well. John Stewart, you know, when- Yeah, that's the other when, one. You've added a lot that's in the pipeline. <clears throat> Absolutely, look, when John came in, we obviously would have said, do what you want. You know, you want to do a, a certain kind of show that's a variation of The Daily Show, what do you want to do? He said, no, I want to do short form. I want to obviously talk about culture and there may be different news pieces. I reserve the right to improvise as I go. I'll refresh it four or five times a day. He's working with a company called Otoy, which have a certain amount of animation built into it. So it's a perfect example of bringing a remarkable original voice mm -hmm. into the house, giving a new opportunity of expression to that original voice, mm -hmm. and saying, we now have the flexibility to let you paint however you want to. My hunch is it'll evolve over time and he'll iterate over time. Mm -hmm. And my, my, my guess will be that the first you know, uh, months of what he does may be different from the second months of what he does or bits and pieces of it. He has free reign to do whatever he wants. Will we hear his voice before election day I'm, in November? I'm not telling you. Oh, oh will you hear, me, meaning his voice Metaphorically, uh, um, will we be seeing and hearing yeah, from him on HBO I'm before election? Yeah, I'm day? hopeful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. I'm hopeful. He's not clamoring at the bitch to talk about Trump today. No. Huh? Okay. No. I think he's clamoring at the bit to do something that he knows is really going to stand out mm. and be a new, um, a new part of his artistic expression. Mm. That's what he's working on. So and, John and Oliver and, and, and Vice, and you also you added Sesame Street. We did. I, is this all about trying to appeal to new groups of people that will then subscribe to HBO well, Now? Go to my addicts point. I mean, right. we're th you, you know, you, we did an interview after we announced the Sesame Street thing, and a uh, reporter who I like and respect said to me, I, I, I don't understand this. Sesame Street on, on HBO, the home of Game of Thrones, <laughs> the, the, the home of, v I understand that. And I said, well, why wouldn't you understand it? Sesame Street is sui generis programming, storytelling mm -hmm. for young people. We're about utterly differentiated and unique programming. We're taking the best of that form and putting it on HBO to reach a different part of our audience. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we did and are doing. And that will iterate, by the way, going forward. There'll be new, there'll be new things coming from, from the Sesame Street uh, Meaning spin-off well. shows? What do you mean? It different, yeah, we're looking at different possibilities, mm -hmm. yeah. And maybe short form? Yep, mm -hmm. absolutely. 
Do you need more children's programming? Do you feel like you need more in that? You don't category? need more, but I think as you begin to broaden out our brand, we look and say family is a big part uh, of viewing on SFOD services. We have a terrific library of family programming. We have a great legacy of family programming. Let's build upon it. And so we thought Sesame Street was a terrific way to anchor that. And again, what starts to happen is when you make an announcement, you get a bunch of talent coming in saying, well, we have some ideas too. And that opens up a whole new avenue for new programming. Are there other categories you need to invest more in, do you feel? I mean, you've got Bill Simmons in the family now. His talk show will start soon. Do you feel like you need to add more kind of sports programming, for example? Listen, our, our, our sports team just does, they're a magnificent microcosm of the company. If you look across the range of programming that makes up HBO Sports, in addition to boxing, you have hard knocks. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you have real sports, which in its, tw you know, its 20th year is seeing ratings that are up over 20, 22%. That's a testament to Bryant and the team. Um, the boxing franchise continues to draw millions of people and bring in new fans. We're always looking with our talent at possible new docs or new stories or new vehicles, maybe a hard knocks in a different sport. We don't need to do anything. What we think about is if an idea comes to us that we think is, is, is going to either fill a hole mm -hmm. or allow us to expand a franchise, um, we lean into it. Mm. And when you look at sort of the roadmap do you have another Game of Thrones? Do you need another Game of Thrones? You know, it's funny. Because I know movies are the priority, <laughs> they're, they're the base of the service, yeah, it's funny. and yet the dramas are what get the attention. Yeah, yeah. So, well, let's be careful. The, the, the dramas get a tremendous amount of attention in the press. press, right? But if you look at Ballers, or Silicon for that matter, or Vice, or, my personal, or, uh, or, sorry, Vice, sorry, or Veep, Veep, not or Vice. John Oliver, you're talking about million. You know, you know what the numbers are on Dwayne's show, on The Rock show? They're over 10 million. Right. That's our, after Sex and the City, that's our second I gotta start watching. Comedy. You should watch it. It's a great show and this season's terrific. Huh. So the half hours are a big piece. Mm. The dramas, of course, always take up uh, a disproportionate share of kind of cultural commentary. But it's funny you say, what's the next Game of Thrones? When, when I know I, it's a terrible when, question. It's fine. I'm happy answer. to answer the question. Look, when, <laughs> when I started my old uh, job um, in 07, I was co-president and my colleague Mike Lombardo and, and I were in, in charge of the creative brief and I mm -hmm. sat with you, um, the question was, oh, Sopranos <laughs> is off. And, and sex and the you guys are screwed. You know, well, what are you gonna do? And, oh my God, no Sopranos, and you put on this piece of shit, um, you know, um, John from Cincinnati, and that's supposed to replace Sopranos. And by the way, it wasn't that. It was actually a much better, <laughs> a much better show than it was given credit for. Um, and my answer at our very first TCA was, look, this is a um, special brand, and this special brand draws special talent. And our job is to listen carefully to the next original voices mm. that want to paint on our canvas. We're, we're gallerists, and we want to be a home for the best painters to come and hang their great paintings, both established artists and emerging artists. And that's what we try to do. We, we try to make sure that um, we provide a home for them. So the line at our door, blessedly, is always very long and plentiful with that kind of talent. And we have four or five things in development right now, any one of which um, could be the next huge drama. What's, mm. what's comical, of course, is anybody who thinks that when we were sitting there watching the pilot, Lombardo and me, in the screening room in LA, and uh. we watched the pilot of Thrones, which was about 50% of the show that ultimately became the pilot of Game of Thrones, <laughs> And anybody who thinks that we look at each other and say, oh, this can be bigger than Sopranos, um, is right. lying to you. Right. You know, right. nobody knows that. What you know is you have something that feels consonant with your brand, you're working with the talent you want to work with, and you believe in their vision, in their voice, you have a shared vision about what you're trying to do, and then you make a bet. And um, we have a pretty good track record of making good bets. So 
I feel very, very comfortable as I look at the pipeline and I look at the people knocking at the door and I look at the scripts that are coming in that, that we're all reading. I think um, we're sitting here in a year, you'll be saying to me, <laughs> oh, wow, that's, that's really something. There's a couple embarrassing stories in the New York Times archives from my time writing about HBO. I'll, yeah, there you I'll go. be the first to admit. I actually love we that will... story. Let's tell that story. <laughs> no, no, let's not. Because <laughs> we will. That, uh, that's, go to... <laughs> that's one of my favorite stories because I'll tell you what that story is. That story is, I, I become co-president in uh, in uh, in July of '07, and Sopranos is going off the air, and Sex and the City is going off the air, and. And Bill Carter, who I adore mm -hmm. and have enormous respect for, uh, calls me up and says, hey, listen, your competition says, you, you guys really, you're not, you're not doing too good. And I got I to gotta, I gotta, I gotta write a story about how, how bad you guys are. And, and I said, Bill, I, I don't even have my cards printed up. Um, how about, get, i tell you what, give us six months hmm. to you know, organize and to begin to build some, nope, got to do it now. Blame the editor. So That's what I always Bill do. writes the story, and the story on the front page of the business section in September of 07 is giant headline, HBO's competitors say they've stumbled. <laughs> and then just to make that insult to injury, the worst picture of me ever taken <laughs> in the upper right-hand corner with a, like an arrow to it saying, and it's his fault. <laughs> And, and so, um, you know, look. Um, we should get that framed for you, actually. I'd love that. I'd love that. <laughs> Who um, were the competitors back then? It was FX, well, it, was Showtime. it was Showtime. It was, yeah, the idea was yeah. Sopranos is gone, Sex and the City is gone, um, you know, they're ascending, right. we're declining, it's over. I believe the quote out of, um, uh, the, the anonymous quote in the piece was HB over. Um, and so... Yeah. We just kind of looked at each other, and I remember I had to give a talk, one of my first talks to the company, and everybody was very nice. I said, look, this is great, actually. Mm. I said, because we know what we need to do, and we know what we're going to do, and we have an enormous number of resources at our disposal, and this is an extraordinary brand, and we have enormous talent inside. Let's focus on what brought us to the dance in the first place, mm. which is listening for great insurgent voices who have something to say, who we align ourselves with. Let's make some bets. Let's relax. And there is no next Sopranos. There's no such thing. Sopranos is a transcendent thing. But there is the next great show. And there is the next great comedy. And there is the next great original voice. And let's just roll up our sleeves and go find them. And it's exactly what we did. And you know, a year and a half later or something, Variety made the company, you know, showman of the year. So, right. um, you know, the job is to play your game, focus, do what you do well, and define the North Star right, which people sometimes confuse. You know, Haley Barber, the, my favorite <laughs> philosopher, um, <laughs> uh, governor of Mississippi, who said to me one time in a political guy, he said, Richard, said the main thing is keep the main thing the main thing. <laughs> and, and the... And the, the <laughs> The, and the main thing is curate quality content mm. and make it exciting for a wide cross-section of your consumer base and then make it available to them how they want, when they want, and where they want. That's the main thing. We're going to go to audience Q&A in a moment, but uh, one follow-up on that competitors issue, uh, kind of competitors 10 years ago versus now. You're going to say everything on TV is your competition, and, and I would say the same thing. But I would say for CNN, it's Fox, and then sort of MSNBC, kind of. For you, is it Netflix and then Amazon, kind of? Or what would you put in that kind of real lead competitors? I think our biggest competitor is people's leisure time. Hmm. Um, you know, there's a, everybody, look, 75% of American VCRs are full. <laughs> think about that for a minute. 75% of American VCRs are full. What does that tell you? It tells you there's a lot of stuff out there. And people, just look at your own lives. I mean, you know, I, I can't tell you the number of times people come up to me and say, this summer, I'm going to get to Thrones. <laughs> Everybody tells me Thrones. <laughs> or I'm going to get to Silicon Valley. Right, gonna, right. And I understand that. For me, I'm still trying to get to the wire. <laughs> people say that. i got to get to the wire. So 
Our, our job is making sure that we have um, the kind of quality on air mm -hmm. that we are very much a part uh, of the cultural conversation and that people are saying over and over again, listen, you have to be, you, in order to be a part of the cultural conversation, you need to understand what HBO is doing. Whether it's, look, John Oliver does a thing, does a rant on, on, on Trump called Drump, and we put it up on YouTube, and does 87 million views. It's extraordinary. That's, that's, that's part of the cultural conversation. Yeah. Beyonce drops lemonade, and you know, the social media world goes crazy. That's part of the culture. It's not just one show. Mm -hmm. It's the brand itself. So people have, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of four hours um, during their day, which is their time. And I think the, the way to think about competition is you want to be at least uh, a, a couple times a week, a few times a week, part of their leisure time. Mm -hmm. And we're kissing between HBO and Cinemax about 50 million. I think we can grow uh, another 12 and a half to 15 million homes very easily over the coming years. Our data on this is very, very clear. And our job is, uh, is to continue to do great work and make sure that we're accessible um, to, to a new consumer base. Can, can so, you be as big as Netflix in the US or is their pricing an advantage? You're, you're a premium price product unlike them. Well, that depends how you define big. Um, as many US subscribers. I would suggest to you that making over $2 billion a year is pretty big. <laughs> and so if you're interested in building your business, growing your sub base, and creating great content, mm -hmm. I don't think there's anybody as big as we are. And should HBO and will HBO ever be spun out? Should it be off on its own outside Time Warner in order to recognize that value? Yeah, look, if, if we, let's do a, hypo, a hypothetical. Say that we, we, were, we were, you know, on our own and, and, <laughs> and Stan, Stan owned us. Um, uh, and, and we were on our own, and he said to me, all right, we own you now over here, Allen and Company, and uh, what, what should we do differently? I would articulate to Stan and to his team the exact same strategy that mm -hmm. I articulate to Jeff and my colleagues at Time Warner, which uh, is grow our business into the ecosystem that exists and to the ecosystem that is expanding, grow our business around the world, make great programming, make sure we have our movie rights secure, which we do because of the points I made to you earlier, well into the next decade because that drives so much viewership. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would exact the exact same strategy that we are implementing now. So mm -hmm. I think it's a, um, it's a very reductive and ultimately uh, silly uh, proposition. Reporters like to write about it, but it may not be realistic. Reporters Are there other like things to write about, about a lot of things. That's that, was, that was my last question yeah, for you. So. Are there other, uh, uh, like HBO or whatever, are there other themes like that you think are overstated out there, either in the well, press or clear. in the kind of in the media I don't media think landscape. anybody's uttered the HBO no, thing they have not. since the, the, it was, it <laughs> since was uh, 2007. Fool, foolishly argued in 2007. <laughs> um, no, I think, look, I think one of the canards that was a little silly that got propagated a while ago, and I think it's, it's, um, it's diminished, is it's HBO and, and against Netflix, or it's HBO. That's just silly. We, we over-index in their homes. They over-index in our homes. We've grown more, as I told you. Mm -hmm. You know, 20 percent of our subgrowth is in the last four years. The Com company is 44 years old. Mm -hmm. Just think about that. So. It's, it's a, it's, I think it's HBO and Netflix, not HBO or Netflix, and um, same, same with Amazon. So we concentrate on playing our game. We concentrate on playing our game as, as, as smartly uh, and creatively as we can. We are always asking ourselves what's next, both creatively and in terms of distribution and distribution options. But we also focus on the main thing, which is <laughs> working with our partners um, in the cable, satellite, and telco business to grow their business and to grow ours, mm -hmm. working with new digital partners to do the same thing, and making sure that the talent is in the door. Mm -hmm. Because um, I can't overemphasize this. That's the secret sauce. Who's coming in? And um, every week, uh, I, I get a phone call and say, you know, so-and-so's here with the following idea. Mm -hmm. And the previous Sunday, you couldn't have imagined that that possibility was was real. That this actor or this producer mm. or this director wants. We just got a script um, 
um, you know, this week with uh, a world-class talent and a world-class director who, um, you know, huge pedigree about a very juicy subject that a week ago um, we didn't know about. And that's hap that happens all the time. That's what's so exciting. And the, the real art, of course, is making the right bets. Let's see about questions from the audience. I think we have a microphone coming around. Let's go right here first. Uh, thanks, Jessica Reeve Cohen from Bank of America Merrill Lynch. Richard, you talk so much about talent. I was just wondering if, um, if it, this might be an advantage for you. If, if it, do, does talent realize that Netflix seems, at least on the surface, seems to be one sale? Like, I, it doesn't seem like there's a second cycle to Netflix for talent. Is that in part of the conversation? Does it affect you at all? Look, I think, you know, one thing that agents and representatives of talent fully understand is how to extend the monetization of their properties. I mean, there's no lack of sophistication about how to do that. So I think everybody knows everything. Um, the truth of the matter is that I think we get a, I think we get a first look at um, most things, not everything, but I, I, I think we get a first look at, at, at a lot. Certainly more than our, you know, uh, certainly our fair share. And so if we say no, there's other places to go. And, um, you know, 10 years ago, you might go to Showtime or FX or AMC. Now you might go to Showtime, FX, AMC, Amazon, you know, Hulu, Netflix. There's myriad opportunities. So that's great if you're an agent and if you're representing a writer or a director or a producer because you know very well that just because HBO says no, or Showtime says no, or AMC says no, that doesn't close the door to options, and we can be wrong. And, um, but, but in terms of the economics, I think everybody knows. Everything and everybody's aware of all the different permutations and advantages and disadvantages uh, of going anywhere. Would you like to tell us who you think are the most valuable folks out there right now that are not lined up with HBO or Netflix or Showtime or others? For example, uh, in December, Donald Trump might be available. <laughs> you could be you know, interested in a reality show. You know, it's are there names like that? Because last fall, you mentioned John Oliver, uh, John Stewart to me, yeah. and then you did the John Stewart deal. So I'm trying to have that happen again. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck. Um, <laughs> I think you know it's interesting. I was saying this to somebody the other day. If you look at um, at some of the jewels in our um, in our crown, if you will, over the past years. Mm -hmm. There are often people who nobody really knew about before. Well, yeah, John or, Oliver was not John Oliver two years it, ago. John yeah. wasn't John, yeah. right? David Benioff and Dan Weiss, who are now pretty much household names in the entertainment, I mean, mm -hmm. they hadn't done any television. Mm. Um, Lena Dunham was a 20, you know, four-year-old kid um, who did a $37,000 <coughs> movie called Tiny Furniture, which one of our executives found at South by Southwest and brought into us to look at and then sent a script. Nobody knew. And she ran the show at 24, 25 years old. Uh, Armando, of course, who was well known in England, but hardly, you know, had the kind of cachet that all these Emmys have now given him mm -hmm. um, and, and, and um, the, the extraordinary acclaim that, and rightful acclaim that the show has. Mike Judge, of course, had, had a lot of pedigree, but it's not, you, you don't know sometimes. Mm. Um, you, you can be very surprised by, and, and, and conversely, um, sometimes, you know, you can, you can work with a very established person and, and you know, um, it, it, it might not land as well. So mm. I think the real key and the real discipline is making sure that you're listening to the idea and the story and then that the writing team has the chops to be able to deliver it. It's not about um, hunting down names. It's about listening carefully for the kinds of ideas and, and, and the kind of storytelling that you want to be a part of. Let's look for uh, other questions. And let's uh, just be clear. Yeah. On Vice, for example, when we did the Vice show, yeah. they, they hadn't done anything quite um, up to you know that level of production right. um, in terms of journalism, and Mike and I, um, you know, made made a bet on Shane and, and the Vice team, and it landed um, magnificently, and they were they were doing great work. But 
they, they hadn't produced anything like that in, in the past. Mm -hmm. we, we believed in, obviously, in Tom, we believed in Shane, and we made the right choice. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go uh, over here and then over here. We, we have a couple mics come over. So, two-part question. Firstly, um, will you ever consider doing a streaming-only show a la Netflix? Um, and secondly... What do you mean a streaming-only show? You mean binging? You mean the whole yeah, series binge? Yeah, all, all, all released. Because all our stuff is... Well, HBO Now no, no, is I mean, a streaming so, so show. Next year, so next year, CBS will launch Star Trek solely online. Is that what you mean? Right, solely on online, all released at once. Um, and then, secondly, less serious, but I have to ask... How hard was it to keep the lie going about Jon Snow's fate? And will you be echoing Kit Harington's <laughs> sentiments and saying, I'm sorry? <laughs> um, well, you know, Kit was running around Belfast eating at all, all the local restaurants and pubs and the paparazzi, the global paparazzi was photographing him. And when I went to the set last summer and Kit was like, having a beer at the bar, I said, well, everybody, and he said, you know, you'd have to be a moron not to have figured <laughs> out, basically, that I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. It, it, it's obvious that, you know, you know. So what I think everybody wanted to hold on to um, <laughs> the the uh, conceit that who who knows what was going to happen. Um, the answer to your first question is um, anything that's on HBO now is going to be on HBO Go, right? And that is ipso facto stream. Right. If what you're saying is, would we stream an entire s season or show, I would never say never to anything. But I would say that we're going to be a little cautionary about it for a couple reasons. Let, let's just look, look at the jinx, for example. And then I'll just talk about a, a miniseries we have coming called The Night Of, which is a murder mystery that Steve Zalian directed and uh, Richard Price wrote, which is unbelievable. And it, it's, it would be a streamer's delight, right? Mm. But you'd spoil the denouement. You'd spoil the surprise. And I thus think you'd spoil part of the fun, which is living with the murder mystery you know, over, over an eight-week period. Huh. Jinx, I think part of the joy of marinating in the jinx was, wow, this guy's nuts. <coughs> What's going to happen? Is it possible? Could it be? And Andrew did such a brilliant job of kind of pulling you one way or pulling you the other. And I think had we streamed the jinx, which would be ripe for that kind of thing, mm -hmm. I think you, you make a very, very, very strong argument that you would detract from some of the joy and fun for the viewer in experiencing it. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying, you know, I think saying, Never is 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 a little bit too pat, but I also we like the you know people like living with the show for ten weeks the social media dynamic the conversation that continues you dump something out into the culture and it's gone immediately you get less of that um, and part of the brand you know conversation over a ten week period a twelve week period that that's a good thing and that also keeps people you know inside your ecosystem sampling and looking at other things. So I would never say never, but those would be my mitigating uh, qualifiers as to why, mm. you know, would be careful to do yeah. it. So go over here in the middle. Uh, you began by saying that you want to reach the consumer by every means possible. Uh, every time you do that, of course, your existing partners lose a little bit of their exclusivity. Once upon a time, only the cable operator could... Have you had that kind of uh, pushback? And if so, how do you deal with it? Well, first of all, our existing partners have every opportunity, and we want them to, bundle our standalone streaming service. In, they, 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 can, they have the physical plant and pipe into the home. So they're there first. They have the relationship with the customer. And we would encourage them, and I think uh, you will see more and more of this, that it is to their advantage, too, to be our partner in doing that. That said, it was very clear to us from our research, which we looked at very carefully, um, that this was all additive, that it was not going to be cannibalistic. So we, you're still not seeing it be cannibalistic a year in? Le less, less than 1% hmm. of our subscriber base has left a subscription to go get HBO OTT. Hmm. And it's really part of a cord never environment. And 
we're simply making it available to them. What we're encouraging our partners to do is join us in that uh, uh, undertaking to reach that consumer. So we think it's additive for them too, and that they can not only get that customer inside their ecosystem, but that having them, they can then upsell them into, into other packages, whether it's a skinny bundle or whether it's an eventual more elaborate digital package. So we haven't seen any cannibalization. Hmm. There isn't any. Um, and our, our goal and our plan and our North Star is do this together. Do you want to be in Hulu and YouTube's uh, in-development streaming bundles? Look, you know, we look all the time at different permutations of distribution. Um, and, you know, I think to the extent that a thousand flowers are blooming out there uh, as to how people can get new customers, that's a good thing for content providers. It's a good thing for great brands. Um, but so far whether, you haven't sold whether, it on Hulu the way Showtime does. Well, you know, we haven't yet because the model that we have right now is the model that we have right now. But we're always thinking and, and iterating going forward. And if you look at your brands, let's give you guys some credit now. Um, you know, the Turner brands are fantastic. CNN is fantastic. And whatever bundles emerge or whatever uh, virtuals emerge, I think it's very good for Turner too. It's mm -hmm. very good for our company, for Time Warner, because you guys have a lot of great brands inside Turner. We're obviously very proud of our brands and have been an a la carte brand our, our whole existence. So as far as we're concerned, um, iterations are a good thing. Yeah. So when AT&T starts selling a direct TV sort of through wireless in the fall, that's a big opportunity for you all, right? I mean, Huge. that's that's where you'd want to be not bundled or you'd maybe add on to that. We love that. Right, right. We uh, love that. A couple more questions. Uh, I think we have a couple minutes left. Let's go over here. Hi, Richard. Betty Cohen. Hi. Um, as, uh, as all of these op uh, op viewing options keep proliferating, how do you keep your marketing expense in check? Because I'm not, I'm not sure the programming costs are getting any less, so. Yeah, well, so there you go. You know, it's, it's an important question. I think digital marketing is key. Micro-targeting is key. And the more data analytics you have, the more cost-effective your marketing can be. So that's a big advantage. I think the dynamism of social media, I, I mean, if you look at the media equivalency power of what Beyonce did, um, what Thrones does over, you can't. You couldn't spend that uh, effectively. It's, it's, I, I hate to draw a Trump analogy, but it, 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 is, it is really the power of social media and free media mm -hmm. that's changing the matrix of what traditional marketing is. Doesn't mean we're not spending hundreds of millions of dollars marketing our brand, uh, we do. But it does mean that there are new ways to optimize your ability to reach current consumers and new consumers. I look at this because I'm a political junkie um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a campaign, right? You know, we have, you know, with HBO and Cinemax, we have about, you know, close to 50 million vote. We have 50 million people in the camp. We want to shore up our base, huh. and then we want to go out and we want to convert those undecideds, what we call persuadables, of which we think there are many, 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 many millions. Mm -hmm. And our job is make sure our base knows that the value proposition that they have is great. We want to talk to them in many different ways. Then we want to go con get those persuadables in. And then, of course, there's a always a part of your the constituency base that whether we're, it's too expensive or they object to the content uh, or, you know, they said, you know, I got enough stuff or whatever it is. You, you, you don't, that's not where you're focusing. But on the, on the persuadable market, which we think is ripe, we're going to focus like a laser, and we're going to do that in, and are doing it in myriad different ways. I think the notion of the old you know, brand campaign where you have to go out and tell people what HBO is, because th this is axiomatic, right? When you have Thrones out there, when you have John out there, when Stuart's coming to the network, we have an enormous amount of reverb in the culture and in the cultural conversation. And that in and of itself is the best marketing you can have because it's third party and it doesn't feel in any way like you're selling. It feels like people are coming to you because they want to be a part of what your, what, what your value proposition is and what you're contributing. 
to the cultural conversation. Let's see if we have time for one more question. We have about a minute left. Anybody else out there who wants to go? Let's go here in the back. Sure. Hey, no um, pressure, but yeah, right. great question, um, real quick. I'm Richard Zelson, founder of MyStream. I, w I read about Dick Costello advising Silicon Valley. I was wondering yeah. what you guys do to work with uh, technology companies and technology startups. And secondly, a little related is, do you plan on doing anything in the social sharing of content space yourself instead of just relying on Facebook to spread it or things like that? This is a good question. Look, our social media team, which I should give a shout out to because they've really, um, they've really done you know, an extraordinary thing for our brand from a standing start um, over the course, of, uh, the course of the last three or four years. And my charge to them uh, always is, in fact, I just had a conversation about this yesterday, is reimagine all the time. Uh, as all of these different um, modes of reaching the consumer base change and evolve, don't think anything is off limits and, and always come back uh, with new ideas and new conversations. I have a 12-year-old. I was watching her the other day on Sunday morning communicate with her, Snapchatting her friends. And, and it was the most phenomenal I experience because they don't really talk to each other <laughs> and they don't communicate in words. They communicate in very strange snippets and photographs which are being passed around. And when I dared ask the question, sweetie, what does that, what did you just do? I was looked at as if I was not only a Neanderthal and a, and a moron, but somehow, I said, don't you want to say that yes, you enjoyed Seeing yourself, he's like, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> and so what, what you're realizing when you're watching all different means of communication among Generation Z and then in the millennial world is, this is changing all the time. And we need to be as dexterous in how we talk to new consumers as we are about iterating our programming. So again, culture is a big thing. So what we try to do is have as much open conversation mm -hmm. about new dimensions of marketing and social media as possible. So the answer is nothing is, uh, is, is, is out of the realm of possibility. I wonder if we'll subscribe time. to HBO now someday via Snapchat. We'll see about that. You know, you know what? You any, just want to be there in case, right? Any distributor who wants to pay us a rate card, we are welcome <laughs> to talk to. Richard Plepper, thank you so much. Thank you, Ben. Thank you.